The great vessels of the heart are the large vessels you see coming off or going into the top portion of the heart. The pulmonary trunk is the most anterior of the great vessels, with the aorta just behind it. Adjacent to the aorta, you can see the superior vena cava bringing blood from the head and upper extremities to the right atrium, while the inferior vena cava brings blood from the lower region of the body. Pulmonary veins can be seen on the back side of the heart entering the left atrium, bringing in freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs. These are the only oxygenated veins. Blood leaving the right ventricle enters the pulmonary trunk, the most prominent and anterior of the great vessels. The pulmonary trunk then abruptly splits into the right pulmonary artery serving the right lung and the left pulmonary artery serving the left lung. Blood enters the left atrium of the heart from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. The right atrium receives blood from both the superior and inferior vena cava. Blood leaving the left ventricle to go out to the body goes through the aorta, which makes a hairpin turn in the first six inches. The first few inches it goes straight up is called the ascending aorta. The sharp corner is called the aortic arch, which has three branches. After the last branch off the arch, the aorta goes straight down. This is when the aorta is called the descending aorta. The part of the descending aorta above the diaphragm can also be called the thoracic aorta, and below the diaphragm it can be called the abdominal aorta. Here we see the ascending aorta above the aortic valve. The aortic arch can be seen with some imaging dye going out to the branches. The descending aorta completes the hairpin turn. The three branches off the aorta bring blood to the head and arms. The first branch is the brachiocephalic trunk where brachio means arm and cephalic means head. This branch is just a couple of inches long and serves as a connector from the aorta to the arteries on the right that serve the arm, the right subclavian artery, and the head, which is the right common carotid artery. The second branch is the left common carotid artery going straight up the neck while the third branch is the left subclavian artery going under the clavicle and out to the arm. The branches off the aortic arch are the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. The branches off the aortic arch are the brachiocephalic trunk, which splits into the right subclavian and the right common carotid artery, then the aortic ant branches off to the left common carotid artery, and finally the left subclavian artery. Blood returning to the heart from the brain comes down the neck through the internal jugular vein. Blood from the head and face drains through the external jugular vein. The internal and external jugular veins on both sides combine with the subclavian veins bringing blood back from the arms and drain into the brachiocephalic veins. The right and left brachiocephalic veins fuse together be to become the superior vena cava bringing the deoxygenated blood from the head and neck back into the right atrium. As a subclavian artery leaves the torso, it becomes the axillary artery at the shoulder region. The axillary artery then becomes the brachial artery as it goes down the upper arm at the anterior region of the elbow. The brachial artery divides into the radial artery on the thumb side of the forearm and the ulnar artery on the pinky side of the forearm. These arteries connect in two anastomoses. One is the superficial palmar arch and the other is the deep palmar arch. Blood leaving the subclavian artery in the torso becomes the axillary artery in the shoulder armpit region. The blood traveling through the upper arm goes through the brachial artery when it reaches the antecubital region or front part of the elbow where it splits into two, the radial artery and the ulnar artery terminating in the palmar arches on the hand. After the nutrient waste exchange and oxygen delivery has taken place, blood returns from the arm back to the heart. From the hand, blood enters both the radial and ulnar veins. These veins come together in the antecubital region to become the brachial vein as it comes to the upper arm. This turns into the axillary vein in the shoulder area to drain into the subclavian vein in the torso. There are many more superficial veins that network together that also contribute to removing the deoxygenated blood from the arm. Again, the radial and ulnar veins come together to become the brachial vein, then the axillary vein, and out of the arm and into the torso through the subclavian vein. After blood leaves the aortic arch, it goes to the arms and head. 
blood going to the head travels through the common carotid artery in the neck. That is the one you are feeling when you take your pulse along the side of your neck. At the level of the jawline, the common carotid artery splits into the internal carotid artery to bring blood to the brain and the external carotid artery to bring blood to the face and skull. Another artery coming up to the brain is the vertebral artery, which comes off the subclavian artery and up through the transverse foramen or holes in the cervical vertebrae. Notice that the brain has two pairs of arteries bringing it blood. After the nutrient waste exchange and oxygen delivery has been made in the head, blood returns via the jugular veins. The internal jugular contains blood from the brain and the external jugular contains blood from the other parts of the head and face. The vertebral vein is in the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae also brings blood back from the brain. Veins are more superficial than arteries. Just under the platysma is the external jugular vein draining blood from the skull and face. Deeper, we see the internal jugular vein draining blood from the brain. As we look even deeper, the common carotid artery is seen bringing blood up to the head. The common carotid bifurcates or splits into the internal carotid artery to bring blood to the brain and the external carotid artery to bring blood to the face and skull. The arterial network delivering blood to the brain has a backup system built in. The vertebral arteries and the internal carotid arteries are bringing blood to the brain arterial network. From the vertebral arteries, blood enters the basal artery. The posterior cerebral arteries branch off while blood continues into the circle of Willis through the posterior communicating arteries. The middle cerebral arteries branch off while the blood continues to the anterior cerebral arteries and then link to complete the circle of Willis at the anterior communicating artery. The significance of the circle of Willis is that if there is a blockage in these vessels, blood has an alternate route. This helps to maintain and protect blood flow to all parts of the brain. Notice that the branches off the circle of Willis go to each region of the cerebrum, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and posterior cerebral artery. From the descending aorta, blood travels toward the abdomen and becomes the abdominal aorta once it goes through the diaphragm. The first main branch off the abdominal aorta is the celiac trunk, which is only about an inch long. The celiac trunk immediately divides into three main arteries, the left gastric artery serving the stomach, the splenic artery bringing blood to the spleen, and the common hepatic artery going to the liver. Going further down the abdominal aorta is the superior and then the inferior mesenteric arteries, which supply fresh oxygenated blood to the intestines. Between the two mesenteric arteries, the superior and inferior, is a branch point for the renal arteries, which deliver blood to the kidneys. Once blood has been delivered to the cells of the abdomen, it must be returned to the heart. From the kidney, the blood returns via the renal vein, which drains into the inferior vena cava, bringing the kidney's deoxygenated blood to the heart. From the intestines and spleen, blood does not drain directly to the inferior vena cava. Blood from the intestines contains absorbed substances, nutrients, etc., that may be either beneficial or harmful or both. Blood from the spleen contains the remnants of broken down old red blood cells. Before returning to the heart and circulating throughout the body, all blood leaving the intestines and spleen is brought to the liver for filtering. The vascular network responsible for bringing this volume of blood from such a wide expanse of tissues is called the hepatic portal system, where hepatic refers to the liver and portal indicates that the blood is going to go through a second capillary bed before returning to the inferior vena cava and then the heart. The celiac trunk immediately branches into three arteries. The common hepatic artery brings freshly oxygenated blood to the liver. The left gastric artery supplies blood to the superior portion of the stomach. The splenic artery brings blood to the spleen. After the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery branches off, supplying blood to the pancreas and much of the small intestine. Just below, the renal arteries go straight out to the kidneys. Farther down, the abdominal aorta, the inferior mesenteric artery branches off to serve the large intestines. The renal veins bring blood out of the kidneys and directly to the inferior vena cava. 
Blood from the superior mesenteric vein, inferior mesenteric vein, and splenic vein travel to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. This deoxygenated waste-containing blood from the hepatic portal vein, along with the oxygenated blood from the common hepatic artery, which came from the celiac trunk, go through the liver for filtering and cleaning. Once filtered, the freshly clean blood leaves the liver via the hepatic vein and then goes to the inferior vena cava and finally the heart. The hepatic portal system brings blood from the intestines and spleen to the liver. This means that the blood is going through two capillary beds before returning to the heart. One, the intestines or spleen, and two, the liver. Inferior and superior mesenteric veins and the splenic vein sends the deoxygenated blood containing body-generated waste and the absorbed nutrients to the liver for filtering. Once the liver has processed the blood, it exits via the hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava, then the heart. The descending aorta ends at the bifurcation to the right and left common iliac arteries just at the rim of the pelvis, level with the hips. The common iliac arteries are about 5 inches long, then split into the internal iliac arteries, which serves the pelvic organs, and the external iliac arteries, which bring blood out to the legs. Blood returning from the legs enter the torso in the external iliac vein, and the internal iliac vein drains blood from the pelvis. The abdominal aorta splits into the right and left common iliac arteries, then splits into the internal iliac arteries serving the pelvis interior, and the external iliac artery serving the leg. As the external iliac artery leaves the torso and goes under the inguinal ligament, it becomes the femoral artery. This goes down the thigh and becomes the popliteal artery as it goes behind the knee. Then the artery becomes a posterior tibial artery along the back of the lower leg. The posterior tibial artery branches to the anterior tibial before serving the front of the lower leg and the peroneal artery serving the side of the lower leg. From the external iliac artery, it becomes the femoral artery, then the popliteal artery, and the posterior tibial artery. Off the posterior tibial artery branches the peroneal and the anterior tibial arteries. Blood returning to the heart travels through the posterior and anterior tibial veins to become the popliteal vein behind the knee. The popliteal vein becomes the femoral vein deep in the thigh. The great saphenous vein is the primary superficial vein of the leg draining into the femoral vein before it enters the torso and becomes the external iliac vein. The posterior tibial vein and the anterior tibial vein drain blood into the popliteal vein which becomes the femoral vein, not shown. The great saphenous vein is a superficial vein that is part of a large network that have anastomoses with deep veins. An important note regarding this vein is that in some coronary surgical procedures, segments of this vein have been cut out and used for a coronary bypass. The fetal circulation has a number of modifications to accommodate the role of the placenta. The umbilical cord contains three vessels. There are two arteries and one vein. The heart has two pulmonary bypasses to reduce the amount of blood going to the lungs. The internal iliac arteries leave the body to go to the placenta through two umbilical arteries. The freshly oxygenated blood returns to the fetus via the umbilical vein, then goes to the liver via the ductus venosus. The liver will filter the incoming blood before allowing the blood to circulate throughout the fetus. Because the fetus gets oxygenated blood from the placenta, the lungs do not need a large volume of blood, so there are two bypasses to reduce the amount of blood going to the lungs. The ductus arterius osus allows blood to go from the pulmonary trunk directly to the aorta, allowing the blood to skip the lungs and left side of the heart. The foramen ovale allows blood to go straight from the right atrium to the left atrium, allowing blood to skip the lungs.